Hi everyone and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to my recap, review, and discussion about Outlander Season 5 Episode 11 Journey Cake which as I'm sure you're all aware or if not you're about to be this was written by Diana Gabaldon. Ooh, let's talk about some fun stuff first and then we'll get into this. So first off I got a Outlander t-shirt Finally, um, I got this from Etsy. I believe the company, or I mean the individual who who put this together, her name, uh, the company is called Bluebell something. I'll put up a um, the real name right here just in case you're interested. Um, it wasn't very much, and I've been wanting an Outlander t-shirt for a while, but I haven't seen one that like said exactly what I wanted or like had what I wanted on it and this one did um, and so I'm really excited to be wearing it in my video I hope that you'll check it out something that I decided to do with the stimulus check that America most of us got is to because I haven't lost my job and I'm not in need I wanted to take that money and do what stimulus means like I wanted to like get it back into um, the community and to small business owners and people who need it. So for me, like that sounds so noble, but basically it meant is I went on a mini shopping spree and I bought a bunch of nerdy things from people who hand make them. Something else that I got from a different channel, I got a new Outlander candle. I had a Fraser's Ridge candle, but I've burned it all. Um, this, this isn't an ad, I promise. No one asked me to do this. I'm just taking a couple minutes to show you what I got in case you're interested and you also want to support people. So if you want to get right into the review, you can just skip ahead like a minute and we'll be good. This is from Salty and Lit Candles and Gifts. And so I got a Sassanac one. This one is Jasmine, Lavender, and Fruit. And I'm telling you, it smells freaking delicious. And I love these kind um, when they are made natural because generally you don't have to burn them to smell them. You can just take the lid off. I usually burn them because I burn them in the bath or something like that. And then this is totally not Outlander related, but from her, I also got a Kylo Ren candle because I really love Star Wars things. So that is a couple nerdy things. I also ordered some phone cases, which aren't here yet, but I just wanted to be able to support um, home creators a little bit because I mean I am one myself it's a different thing I'm using my voice and my face to do things but I just wanted to do a little something so okay enough plugging let's talk about journey cake I'm gonna talk uh, about some positive things and then I'm gonna do my normal kind of recap I'm gonna go through the recap pretty fast um, I'm gonna try to and then I'll get into how I feel about what's happening because whew, I'll be honest at the front of this video I felt a couple things when it finished last night granted number one it was really late because I had friends over until about 11 30 so I didn't get to start it right away so I didn't get finished until almost one in the morning and I was exhausted and I was crying in frustration when this episode was over and I was also really scared to talk about it today. Normally I'm very excited to wake up and do my review even if I haven't loved the episode. Um, because I know this is going to be even harder for me because this is Diana's episode. And I love Diana. She can do no wrong to me. But Diana as a screenwriter, and she would even tell you this. She's told us this in interviews when she did her first episode back in season two. Diana as a screenwriter... Um, has to be different than Diana as the author because when she's a screenwriter, when she's adapting a script, she has to go with what, number one, what's already being told by everyone else, and number two, like where they're going with it. So the places where I think Diana did her best for us, the fans, is to give us these little snippets of things from the books that we hadn't got to see before or the other writers didn't think were as important. And I feel like she really took the time to get those things in there. I also think it's immediately apparent that she knows the characters better. Of course, they're hers. And I feel like every interaction, almost every interaction with a character besides interactions that again are already set up by other people before her, I immediately felt safe with my characters and I felt like they were the characters I love, which you know has been my biggest lament and my biggest pain 
for the last two seasons is characters not doing what I feel is true to who they are. So those things are the things I think Diana is able to bring that no one else can or tried to or did. But the things that are still just as frustrating is it's still becoming very clear where they're going with the story and the parts of the story that I value most and I as a reader am here for aren't there. And to a degree, there's nothing Diana can do about that. She can't change the trajectory of a season with one episode. Well, I'll get into some more of that later because I told you I'd start with recap first, but just telling you where my head was at, as usual, I'll put this preface, and I feel like I should say this, I can't believe I waited till episode 11. This is a full spoiler show, or a show by me, what I'm doing. I talk about this book, I will talk about future books. If you're not past this, I'm sorry. But they've, I mean, they've skipped way ahead. It's very clear that that wasn't a one-time thing. Um, some things happened in this that we knew were coming. We were really suspecting where this season was going to end and everyone is right who guessed that. And yeah, I mean, I've only had a few people be, and also I've had some of you ask me questions about future books and want me to tell you. I will tell you because I'm someone who I like to know spoilers. So if you ask me a spoiler question, um, know that I will answer you. And nobody's been mad about that, I'm just telling you. Um, but I'm not like other forums where they're like, we don't spoil things ahead of where the show is at. Because that's fine. It's cool for those to do that. But I will always tell you all the knowledge that I have about something. So that's more of like not a threat or whatever. It's just to be aware when you're in my comment section that if you're someone who doesn't want spoilers, like be careful if you're in there. Because I don't want to ruin something for you if you don't want to be ruined. But Okay, enough of that. We know how long these videos are without me taking my time. So, the basic lineup of this episode, and I'm going to go kind of quickly because I have a lot to say after this. So, we start this episode. We're in the autumn of 1772. We have Roger, Bree, Jamie, and Claire are on their way home to the ridge from somewhere, or they're going somewhere, and they come across a burned-out cabin, and we find um, some people who are dead, and we find someone who is mostly burned alive but still breathing. And Roger um, puts them out of their misery while Jamie says, like, a soft prayer to them. The number one, the makeup and special effects for that were mind-blowing. It was a very sobering start to the episode. And on reflection of where we end the episode, I see how that's supposed to be kind of like a foretelling of how dark things may be in the final episode. But as I was watching the episode, it felt really out of place because we have this super intense opening and then we kind of went to more like lighter things sort of going on. So it felt really jarring until of course it did pull back around again. So I'm not critiquing this, I'm just telling you. I'm watching that and like, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And then we're making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Anyway, so, then we have um, Ian is playing with Jemmy with the opal um, and Jemmy thinks that it's hot, Bree thinks that it's hot, Roger thinks that it's hot and we have that whole conversation about if you can travel you can feel it. This felt very abrupt <laughs> because there's been no mention about being able to like hear the gems before um, and then it cracks. Um, I, I realized that they couldn't put a child in danger the way in the book where the rock actually explodes and almost like could have killed Jemmy. Um, and it kind of just like cracks in his hand, which that makes more sense. So they figure out that he can travel and it's a very abrupt answer. And then right away we're questioning, will you go back? Because now you know, are you going to go back? Which just feels so abrupt because Jemmy in the show, he's still very little and they know how dangerous that trip is. And I think that them just like, as, but it's been set up through the season that as soon as we know if he can travel, we can leave. But then it had to do with like, we need to leave because of Bonnet. Well now Bonnet's dead. And now we know he can travel. And because the war is coming, 
which is four years away at this point because it's only 1772. We just need to jump ship and go back to the future right now. We got to do it. So that's happening. Then we have the Browns show up and we see Hodgepile and Donner. Now, I didn't catch them saying Donner's name in the show. Did you? Please answer me because I was watching and like I saw who I thought was Donner. But I only remember them saying Hodgepile's name um, when they pointed him out to us, which, yeah, oof, ooh, ooh, foreboding, like such foreboding there. He's just a nasty, oh, he's just nasty. And then at the end in the credits, it said Donner's name. So it told us that that native man that we saw with the really long black hair, that that was Donner. But I don't remember them saying his name in the show. So I kind of thought that maybe that was a little like you were supposed to know that. But if they did say his name and I just like missed it, please let me know. Because this episode is really hard for me, as I said. So I may have zoned out at different points. But um, the Browns are asking Jamie to join their committee of safety. They remind Jamie that when he was collecting people for the militia, they didn't hesitate. They did hesitate. But then we have one of the Browns. He has an injured leg. Claire fixes him. Blah, blah. They talk about his daughter and um, they talk about the baby that they adopted. And I mean, he's not the greatest person to ask information for because he doesn't really give a flying whoop about it. But sounds like the baby's doing well and that's exciting. So then we have Ian confronts them uh, about he has the notes from what we assume or which we know is from Ottertooth and talks about him being from the future and he they don't really talk about what it means yet I'm assuming Claire will find out more from Donner next episode or we'll talk more about that maybe that'll be uh, what season six is about um but they tell him where he's from and they just have him be kind of incredulous about it like he still says i always knew you were a fairy auntie which is really good i like that but then we have ian do something kind of interesting so i'm going to skip ahead in the app a little bit here ian wants to try to go through the stones back in time to fix something with his wife but we can't do that. He's very urgent about wanting it. I really love that we're seeing more of the broken side of Ian, that he isn't fixed after Roger had a stern talking to with him, because I think that's absolutely correct. Like, Ian's not just okay because of this, but I don't know. It's odd. Like, Ian, the way they're having him be is just a little bit odd to me, um, but I'm an Ian fanatic in the books, so I'm very sensitive to, like, differences in him but I like how broken that he looked um also again I'm kind of skipping some stuff I'll go back to where I was at Brie and Ian have the only conversation they've had this season granted Ian's only been back for three four episodes but you all know how upset I was about Roger and Brie going on the like how that was switched out where normally like Brie goes on a trip with Ian and they have a heart to heart and he explains a lot of things to her. And then when Marcelie has her baby, he explains more about what happened to him and we haven't had any of that. So we're just seeing him be kind of angsty about it, which is fine. It takes Ian many years before he fully shares what happened with him and Emily. And in fact, I'm reading an echo in the bone and he's just getting his closure for things that happened with Emily and Isabel. And it hurts me. It hurts me a lot. But we have the one and only scene between him and Brianna. And just, I can tell that Diana was writing this because even in the few dozen words they say to each other, I'm mourning the relationship that there could have been. And not a relationship. I mean this cousin relationship where there's so much love and respect and fondness. And I'm mourning not having it. And it hurts me that there wasn't more interactions with them that they weren't able to be the friends that I wanted them to be. And it makes me very sad, it makes me very sad. Okay, going back. So we have Ulysses, uh, he's been hiding in the shack in the woods since he killed Forbes. 
um, we find out a few things. One, it's obvious that he's in love with her and that she freed him when Hector died. And Forbes is actually the one who signed his Freeman papers, but he decided to stay for her, which indicates that she's probably in love or he's in love with her. They're making it seem like unrequited love, maybe, but then why did she free him? She doesn't have a problem having other slaves, but she freed Ulysses. The reason for that in the book is because they have been sleeping together for many, many years. They're in a relationship together. And so she didn't feel good, which I love that she's cognizant of that. I love that. That Jocasta realized that having sex with her servant when he's a slave doesn't give him any power to say yes or no. And she never wanted to wonder if when she was sleeping with the man she loves, if he was there for duty or for her. That never gets brought up. We don't have time to do that. We just know that we're going to try to find a way to save Ulysses from getting hanged because he killed a white man and it doesn't matter if he was literally saving Jocasta's life or not. We've seen this before. We've seen this back in the beginning of season four. Slave hit his master who was beating him. He was killed. And this guy actually killed a white man. Oh, that kind of gets left hanging for a minute. But my thoughts on this are... I'm okay and I'm not. In the one way I'm okay with it, I'm okay that we never really did do any of the, the slave storylines that were in um, four or five or six, I guess, because I've seen how the TV show has handled the um, slaver situations and we don't really want to be watching that anyway. I always thought the story was complicated and a little bit icky in the books anyway, especially when I reread everything that happened with Phaedri, Ulysses, Jocasta, and then um, the daughter. I can't remember her name. Um, I understand that that would not be great for TV. I didn't think it was great in the books. I thought it was a really complicated interesting story to tell um, but Duncan isn't really important to us here so having that whole complicated story is fine so I'm okay with that I'm okay that we made Ulysses a hundred percent um, sympathetic character we're showing it as like unrequited love in the show though because he literally brought Jocasta to hookups with Murta. so I find it hard to believe or would be incredibly cruel of her if she had freed him for them to still have a relationship but then was sleeping with Murta while she'd done that. It would kind of take away the generosity of her freeing her lover for her to then, but you're still my servant and you're helping me go have sex with Murta. So this is why now they've had to make that more of an unrequited love situation, but then why did she free him? Because one thing equals the other. She freed him so they could be in a relationship. But then why did she free him if they're not in a relationship in the show? But either way, we're kind of just like shoo-shooing this away. Because then, then we have, do, 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 do. oh, we have something else. So first, Bree and Roger, they've decided to go. They're going to leave within the month. And now starts a headlong race towards Bree, Roger, and Jemmy going back to the future. And I will tell you guys this just now. I was waiting for the thing that happens to Claire to be the thing that stops this from happening. So I'm just going to put that out there. I had full faith that something was going to go down and like delay their leaving. So I'm just going to put that out there now and I'll continue. So then we have Lord John show up, which again, I've said this many times and I'll say it again. I never mind some Lord John Gray in my Outlander. I adore him. I adore the actor. I adore how he plays John. He has this soft-spoken gentleness that is how I feel about him in the books. Um, on my poll last week, by the way, a lot of you picked for me to do the Lord John Gray books. It's not what won my poll, but enough of you said you want it that I will make sure that I get to that eventually. But I love Lord John Gray. In the seventh book, I'm getting much more time with Lord John right now, and I am obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with my time with Lord John. I love him. However, he becomes kind of a fix-all for us for some situations. Here we go. So Lord John is here. He brings a gift for Jamie. He brings a new portrait of William to him. Um, William, I believe now, because we have kept the timeline back because 
the way we've like held this back, William should only be about 16 right now, I think. I would have to look up his birthday. Um, but right now I'm reading an Echo in the Bone and it's 1776 and I think he's 20, 21 right now. Maybe he's a little bit older, but I think that's all of these. So if it's 1772, I think he's about 16. I'll look up birthdays. I'll tell you how old he would be in 1772. I'll tell you right here. He comes and they're openly talking about him. They have kind of this lovey thing. John's planning to go back to England because Hellwater, the Lord Dunsany has died. And John is, you know, kind of, he was, he's a son-in-law to them because he married Isabel. So he's going to go back and help with everything. And so this is him like saying goodbye because he doesn't know when he'll come back. And then we get to have some fun scenes. We, if not frustrating to me still. So John is talking about maybe someday you'll get to meet him. Um, I don't know where this is coming from because Jamie and John are both extremely adamant, extremely adamant that William must never meet him again because the minute that he remembers that one, this is Mac, his groom as a child, and two, that this is, he look, they look exactly alike. In fact, we'll get to more of that in a minute. So the fact that they're reminiscing about maybe someday you'll get to meet him and he's so much like his father and all these things, I'm just like, no, like John and Jamie are so adamant that Jamie should never come across William because he would inst like if he was reminded who Jamie was and knew that he'd worked at his home, like he would know he was a bastard and it would ruin him. Like it would ruin him if he knew who his father really was. And the fact that we're just talking about it calmly and I know it's supposed to be a sweet moment. But these two aren't usually this sweet together. I think we do that because, I mean, everybody ships them a little bit, even though we, we love Jamie and Claire, like we love Lord John and we want him to be happy. It's just a bummer that his happiness is Jamie Fraser, who can't even like, there can never even be just a like anything, anything. And so we're playing this sweet, almost romantic kind moment between these two best friends and I'm just like, Jamie usually keeps this a little more on the like, he doesn't let it get into this, into this state because it's cruel to John and it's also, he doesn't feel that way, you know? So I don't know, it was weird, but Diana is teasing us a little bit. I still love how she's writing these characters. Remember, remember, I love Diana. I trust her character work. I don't like how the story is doing this. Um, and I don't know if this means, are we not seeing Lord John again? I can't believe that. Like, I don't believe that. But maybe they're giving a reason why we, like, wouldn't see him for a while because he's going back to England. I really don't know. I have some theories to share at the end of this, but we're almost getting there. So then we have the, this is a really cute scene. And again, this is one that I mean where I think Diana was, like, fitting in scenes that we'd, like, missed. There's a cute scene where, like, Claire is kind of having a hot flash for the first time. And, well, maybe not the first time, but she had put on like her special perfume and then Jamie fell asleep. And so then she's awakened in the middle of the night with hot flash and she goes to the window and Jamie hears her and wakes up and comes over to kiss her. And he's like, oh my gosh, you put on the special perfume and I fell asleep. You wanted me and I fell asleep. I'm so sorry. And it's so cute. That is such a cute, like domestic thing of just between a husband and a wife where you know, someone was ready to be a little frisky and he was too tired. And she, of course, is understanding because it's like, I mean, they are older and they're busy and they have a lot going on. But Jamie always has time for Claire. So they get a little bit frisky and he leans her out the window and gives her some happy time down below, which I love. I love. I love. And I love that Diana wrote this. I love that she was writing a love scene for us. And it's showing like what she does because Diana... How she wrote a love scene in this is how she writes them in the books. People think the Outlander books are so full of sex. They're not. They're not that full of sex. It's so romantic because the characters are so deeply in love that their everyday actions feel sexual sometimes, but not because they, ooh, there's just so much passion in these people that the way they care for each other and the way they do day-to-day -day things is loving, is kind, is appreciative of the other person. 
And I love that because Diana sets the whole scene up and then we go to black very quickly. So you know exactly what's going on and then it's over. And then we have the sperm under the microscope scene, which this is where, like I said, a lot of things just started bouncing around because we've been in book six for a bunch of this. This is clearly a book five scene. It's in chapter 30 on page 378 of my book when Claire wakes up or when Claire is looking at sperm in her new microscope and Jamie's like, ooh, are these germs? And she's like, they're not germs, they're sperms. And he's like, what's that? And she's like, they're for making babies. And he's like, whose is it? And she's like, well, they're yours. Who do you think they are? And he's like, well, how did you get them? Like she, like, and she's like, well, honey, <laughs> when two people love each other, no, I'm just kidding. She's like, I was in possession of some of them this morning, which I just think, mm. like, oh my gosh, anyway. I always love that. The first time I read that scene, I like blushed so hard and giggled. Granted, I was only like, well, I was 22, but I'm older and wiser and more hardened to things now. <laughs> but it was so cute. And so we get that scene, but he doesn't like lead into anything more there. We just like have that scene and it's over. And this is when I started to get a little suspicious. So then we have Jamie telling Brie about Willie. <laughs> and maybe this is in some ways too Diana herself as a writer giving people things that like they had wanted in the books maybe people have mentioned these over the years to her that Brie in the book finds out about William in a completely different way um, in the books she is they are in town for the killing of Stephen Bonnet like he's going to be executed and she runs into um Lord John and then she runs into someone and she says oh my god it's Da because this 20 year old young man looks exactly like her father same height not as burly no gray hair but looks exactly like her father and he's with Lord John and she's like shit number one that's the son I've always heard about for Lord John and number two He's definitely my brother. And then she actually like threatens Lord John and Jamie and says, I'm going to talk to him and speak with him because I'm going back to the future. And they're like, please don't tell him who he is. He can't know. And she's like, I won't tell him, but I'm going to talk to my brother for what will probably be the one and only time. And so her and Jemmy and Roger and Amanda I'll go and talk with Willie and Willie it's cute because he's a little bit like infatuated with her which and not in a gross way she's much older than him and he just thinks that she's sweet and he loves her family is adorable and they have a moment and John and Jamie are upstairs at the hotel or in a building and they're looking down and John is so nervous and Jamie was like this was her demand she's not gonna tell she just wanted to meet him and Jamie never goes to talk to him because he can't see Willie so he has to see him from afar and John is so nervous but he tells you know between him like they tell the story about how Willie came to be and so she gets to meet him and then leaves and he never sees her again as of yet so anyway we have Jamie telling Brie about Willie and again two for two we have this Jamie just being so open about his kid when it is you know kind of a life or death secret for some things but again in this case we're about to have Brie go back and I guess we want her to know about Willie but oh my gosh we'll get, we'll get to it we're still not done and then we have Brie talk to Lord John Gray and they talk about how wonderful um, how wonder, like how they're so alike, how he hopes they'll meet one day. And she's like, maybe. And also we'll mention that she's going to Boston with Roger, which they say, they keep saying, oh, it's so far away. It's so far away. And I'm just like, it's not. You're telling me that no one in that area will ever go up there and not look for them when they're on the same continent. There's a reason that they decide to go back to some of Roger's family in Scotland and go into Europe because it's much more unlikely that no one from where they are will travel the sea to go visit them. And it'd be much more realistic for them to never run into them 
if they're there. Because if you still lived, even if it was a month's journey away, you would never go see your grandkids, your daughter, for the rest of your life if they just moved a month's travel away. Not buying it. So they're even half-assing where they're going to get away from us. They're just going to Boston. Whew. Then we know what we're doing with Ulysses. He is going to be going um, back to England with John. I thought this was a cool, for the Ulysses we have, um, who is a noble, like a noble person of character, he will be a free man as soon as he steps on to a British ship because that belongs to the UK. And at this point, um, well, I don't think, they haven't been freed yet because that happens in like the 1780s or 90s, um, much sooner than the US, the U.S. does end slavery. But still, because he's been freed and has the papers for it, I guess they're more like honoring of it. I'm not sure. But either way, he'll be a free man as soon as he leaves with John and they're going to be chess partners. And we're supposed to be like, oh, goody, happy ending for them. And I am happy. For this Ulysses we know, I'm happy he's getting that life because he's not the complicated character he is in the books so um then we all have pb and j's at the table which is cute i thought this was cute that they're working on making peanut butter i feel like it takes a really long time to happen because now we're down to only like a couple days before they're leaving and now i started freaking out and freaking out now i was like wait this isn't happening. And then we see um, Roger gives their land to Ian um, and says, then take care of it for us. This belongs to you now. I thought that was cute. Um, and then they're on their way to the stones and they each have one of the stones <laughs> and they're going up to it. And I'm just writing, this can't be happening. Like that's what I'm writing because I kept waiting for something to happen that would stop them. And so I'll finish out with their story. So we, so uh, they tie a rope around themselves and because for some reason they get stuck and, and Ian has to pull them back and then they all touch the stone together and they're just gone. And Ian walks up and touches it himself and he doesn't go through, he stays. And then we have them all wake up and they're like, oh, it feels like it's torn apart, oh gosh. And then we just hear them go, what the devil? And it stops. So we don't know what that means. They disappeared from there. So I assume they went back to the future, but they haven't confirmed that yet. But I'm gonna say that unless they change the rules of that, that they do end up where they were at in, in the same place, but in the future. So we will, we will hold that thought and we'll see what happens. So I just wrote, I just, guys, I just wrote, I can't even, what's happening? Is this really happening? Like, really, what's going on? What's happening? So then we get to the kidnapping. So something else that I wasn't mentioning along the way is we had that initial interaction with the Browns. The Brown had a hurt leg. Then he brought his wife back to Claire because she'd broken her arm. Um, she had refused to sleep with him during that time where Dr. Rawlings in the paper said that a woman, a woman can get pregnant and he knows that Dr. Rawlings is saying those things and when he is in Claire's surgery, he sees the medical box that says Daniel Rawlings on it and so he knows that she's Daniel Rawlings, which has been a little seeds we've been planting the whole season. <sighs> And then we have the still gets blown up and Browns and his men actually come to the ridge because all the men went to the still, the four men. Do we not just remember a few episodes ago when there was 60 effing people walking around the ridge all the time and now there's only four men and like three women there? <sighs> And so the men are gone at the stone, they come back, and Jermaine comes up to Fergus, which does for side note, did Fergus not just look so handsome with his like loose shirt and like anyway, sorry. They were like digging holes before, and normally we always see him fully dressed. Anyway, side note. I love 
the man who plays Fergus. I think he's perfect. And Jermon is like, Mama won't, make, Mama won't wake up and the bad man took Auntie or Granny. So Jamie runs inside. They find Marcelie passed out on the floor and the surgery destroyed and Claire's gone. And so then we have Jamie grabbing the torch and he runs to the hill. We have this beautiful shot, cinematography court, of him running up the hill and lighting the cross. That is number one really cool because we had Jamie talk in the beginning about that lighting the cross would mean a call to war. Now he never did that in the show. He never lit the cross when they gathered the militia. He went and gathered them person to person. He didn't light the torch. He didn't light, he didn't light the cross. And he said like that would be a call to war if he ever did that. He also said earlier in this episode that he called that militia in a time of war. Putting together a hunting party to punish people is not enough of a reason for him to gather all of his people together because they want to play cops and robbers. But he lights the cross for Claire because for him, taking his woman, taking his wife, his true love, his mate, that is an act of war. And that's the end of the episode. And then I wrote, what a cluster fuck. <laughs> so a couple other things I wrote on the back. Um, they're blaming this kidnapping on a couple of things. One, I think they're trying to say, too, they're punishing Jamie for not joining them. Um, not sure why they would blow up his whiskey still. They didn't have a chance to explain anything that happened up there. Like, I'm guessing they, did they steal, did they try to steal some of the whiskey beforehand? Like, what, what were they doing? Because in the books, they come and try to rob the whiskey still, and Claire and Marsley and Jermon are up there alone, away from the ridge, away from all of the people. And that's why no one's there to help them. If that had happened on the ridge, there's 50 people around. Where was Mrs. Bug and Mr. Bug? Like, Arch Bug, he, I, I think that's like, is that who was getting his arm fixed? Was that Arch? I don't know what happened with there, who that was. I don't think it was. Arch is like older than that guy looks. But Brown comes after Claire in her surgery, and it's supposed to be because she was giving medical advice. That's the reason we're kidnapping her, because she's, she's trying to take care of people's health. I know she's messing with sexual reproduction, which is burn her at the stake. I, I get it. I know the time period we're dealing with. But to blame her getting kidnapped and this on that. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. Okay, so. I went through the episode, and as usual, it took me 40 minutes to do it. I think I've shared a lot of my feelings. So one of the things that I wrote in here, and I'll say this, I feel that they gave this episode to Diana because they wanted us not to complain as much. I wrote that in my notes. That's what I was feeling. Because we put all these different things together. We are mashing things from books. We're hopping from scenes from book to book, back and forth. It happened at least four times. And if Diana's writing it, the fans of the books won't bitch about it or we can't because we're afraid of the backlash from other book lovers. Well, I know that this isn't Diana's doing where this story arc is going. So as I said at the beginning, I'm very clear that the things I have to thank Diana for is number one, creating this to begin with. I love this woman. I love her stories. I love what she does for me. I, again, think it was a very apparent which parts were her being able to take creative license of her own works and where she had to toe the line for the story that's already got to here. I'm not necessarily calling this story the cluster F. I'm calling the season as a whole that because it's led us to this point. I think a lot of us who've speculated that season six will be the last one were right. They were talking like that at the like clip at the end where they're like, we've had to rip through a lot, but that's because we need to get where we want to get for the final season. Or I mean, they didn't say that, but for season six. And my thought is, what's the rush? Unless you're pretty sure you're not going to get seven and eight. And I've said this, like, I'm okay if it doesn't stay, like, I would be okay if the show had ended where they hadn't finished the books. My ideal dream, I can't remember if I said this episode, would be that they had finished the stories happening in five and six 
and ended with Brie and Roger going back. Like if that was the end of the show, if they'd been through all these adventures with us and then they've had Amanda and they realize they need to go back for her and then we have this bittersweet goodbye but they've lived so much life with us that by the time they go back they didn't want to but they do for their daughter and they have like a plan in place of how they will still communicate and how you know they'll know what happened with their parents eventually and I feel like we've skipped over my favorite parts of the series. And this is why I was crying last night. I'm gonna try not to do it now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna cry. <sighs> While I was watching this last night, I wanted nothing more than to be able to divorce my thoughts from the books away, right? I really wanna just enjoy this. And I realized, and I've said this, like the show, is it for me anymore? Because I'm feeling it's so twisted from what I love that it was hurting like when they were going back last night i was crying and not out of like sadness for the characters i was crying out of anger i was crying out of anger that so many storylines i love and characters i love and situations i love are just gone and we won't get them because we're skipping them to get to what they think is where they want season six to be and i don't know what that is are you jumping right to the revolution are you jumping over six years of everything to jump to the revolution which isn't even finished in the books yet like we're not done with it so you're skipping so many wonderful things to get to what? Like, I just don't know. I don't know where they're going. And I've said this before, my favorite parts are the characters. There's no Christie's. There's nothing happening with Lizzie and what happens with her. There's not the relationship built between Brie and Ian. There's not the relationship between Jamie and Roger. There's not the relationship between, like, just the love that all these people have together. Um, we hardly even know Archbug and his wife. We hardly know anything about them. We don't know, a bit. there hasn't been the sickness that happened. There hasn't been Claire being sick. There hasn't been like, oh, and then we've sent Brie and Roger away. And like, now I understand. Now I understand why they didn't bother building the Roger and Jamie relationships because it's not gonna happen. And I'm so upset, guys. I'm so upset because that's my favorite. And I know I still have the books. People tell me that. I keep it separate. I keep it separate. It's fine. I can't. My heart doesn't work that way. My heart doesn't work that way. This is why I don't do normal movie to book adaptations because I always pick the book. I always love it. I thought this would be so fun doing these and I still enjoy the interaction with you guys. I love the conversations I get to have. You're my therapy when we talk about this and I love that. But I just have to be honest, like I'm not gonna just sit here and be like, well, this was a great episode and I loved it. It was beautifully put together. I don't like how they rushed through things. I still won't be okay with that. From minute four, like from the minute that the opening credits were done and we found out Jamie could travel, Jemmy could travel, they're like, we're leaving. And I just hate that. I wanted Bree to say, no, I'm not ready to go yet. I wanted them to <clears throat> stay, like, Roger won't be there to answer Jamie's questions about Claire. Like, Jamie, Roger helps them save Claire. Like, he loves Claire. Mm, I'm hoping so much that whatever happened with the stones, that, like, they're not really going back. Like, I don't know. I don't know. So, I'm sorry this, episode, this one's ending sad. Um, but I was so mad last night. Like I said, I dreaded recording this today because... I don't have a lot of good things to say and I feel like these episodes like these have kind of spiraled so <clears throat> maybe I'll just have to go back to I mean obviously we're finishing out the show I'm still gonna rank all the episodes of this season like I'm not done with Outlander content because Outlander is like original Sassanac here but I don't know how much like more like of this I can take, I don't watch things that make me unhappy. I am a reader for complete escapism and enjoyment. That's why I love to read. That's why I have a booktube channel. I like to talk about happy things. I like to be joyous and celebrate the things we love. And this has turned into a ranting series and I need it to go back to being happy. So 
we're gonna have to see where this ends up and where it starts and who knows like it could be two years before we get season six so saying that I'm not going to do this for season six would be dumb to say right now because I don't know how I'll feel two years from now I might have been able to calm down a little bit and rewatch this show without having my heart ripped out so that's not what we're saying here this isn't me being like I'm done with stars outlander it's just I'm really hurt right now and I feel like they gave this episode to Diana so that I wouldn't so that I would say but Diana's okay with it Diana wrote this episode it's fine that we're ruining everything it's okay and I don't feel that way because I I know that Diana treats them differently but I know she also stands by what she wrote. Like, she shared that. So, I love her. I'm going to keep reading these things, keep watching these things. And I hope you'll stick with me. I'm sorry that I'm a whiny bitch today. But please share your thoughts with me. Tell me how you're able to separate them, if you do. Like, how you... Because I'm telling you the truth. When people just say, you have to look at them differently, I don't know how. I don't know how. Because I'm so addicted to the show, just like the books, because I think everyone looks like it is and it's so beautiful. But then I'm not getting the depth and the richness that I get from the books. And I just can't like pick one over the other. So if you have how you do it, tell me. Because I'm not just blowing smoke here and trying to be difficult. Like if I could enjoy the show as its own entity, I would. But I can't because I have five years of history with the show and the books. The show gave me the books. So it's a circle. Like I can't hate the show completely because I wouldn't be reading these books if I didn't watch that first episode. So thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you so much. You guys are amazing. Um, I have a, my 2,000 subscriber Q&A going up this week, and there's some Outlander questions on it that you guys asked me. Um, a big part of my success this year is because of you guys watching this and supporting me, and I love you so much. I love you so much. So thank you so much for watching. I put up new videos three to four times a week, and you can watch some more of them right now. Bye.